Hey, what's up? What's up? So it's just that Salvation Army, and um, I found a really, really important book. It's called A Life God Rewards, Why Everything You Do Today Matters Forever, by Bruce Wilkinson with David Koch. It's blurring out on my thing, but it's kind of what it looks like. Okay. Um, this is chapter five. This is a, this is a really important chapter. And um, if you guys will stick with me through this, you'll get a lot of fruit that I got out of reading it. Okay. So I'm just going to read it to you and uh, just give me about five minutes or so. And um, just listen. So it says uh, it's titled the question of your life. Whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life for a, a ransom for many. Jesus in Mark 10, 43 and 45. When you get there, what do you think your most powerful desire in heaven will be? It took 80,000 men to give me a clue. I was part of a capacity crowd of Christian men gathered in Detroit's carnivorous Silver Dome Stadium. When the speaker finished, the worship team stepped up to lead us in the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. What started as a quiet refrain increased in volume and with each verse. When we finished the hymn, we started over, this time louder. Eventually, the stadium seemed to shake from the playing field of the highest tier with the sound of our worship. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, Holy, Holy. We sang it on our knees. We sang it with our arms stretched high. We sang it with our heads thrown back and at the top of our lungs. The worship went on and on until we lost all sense of time and our fingertips seemed to touch the edge of heaven. Just when I thought the volume would blow the stadium roof off, the arena erupted in thunderous applause to God. I thought that beautiful roar sounded a lot like heaven. Never had I reached so deep into my soul to worship the Lord. Yet the deeper my expression of worship became, the more desperate I felt to do something more. At one point, I turned and shouted to a friend, I want to worship more deeply, but I can't find any place to go. Years later, the sound of those men's voices united in praise still echoes in my memory. I remember, too, what I felt in my own heart that day. And I can imagine when I'm worshiping in the very presence of God with an innumerable host, I'll feel it a hundred times more. That's why I think in heaven, I'll feel something close to desperation. Does that word surprise you? When you and I stand together in the presence of God, knowing and seeing who he is and all that he has done in his sovereign power to move us from birth to that day, we will pour out our thanks and praise him, joyfully doing our best to shake the rafters of heaven. But I'm also convinced that we will desperately long to do something more. That's what this chapter is about. The words and examples of Jesus, along with my experience in the Silver Dome, convince me that in heaven we will desperately crave to serve. When we see our Savior, we will be swept up in a consuming, eternity-long desire to respond in love to Jesus, and worship and praise won't be enough. We will want to do something for him. Think about it. When you and I love someone with all our heart, words are wonderful and precious, but we're compelled to go beyond words to action. We long to give, to help, to protect, to serve. Words weren't enough for God either. He loved every person in his world so much that he did something dramatic. He gave his son in order to save us, John 3, 16. And Jesus said that the greatest expression of love is to do something, to lay down one's life for his friends, John 15, 13. In this chapter, we'll see the direct connection between how well we manage our life for God on earth and how much our Lord will graciously allow us to serve him in heaven. Again and again, Jesus told stories about servants commissioned to take care of valuable assets that belong to the master. For example, money, fields, or vineyards. A helpful word to describe this role and one the Bible uses is steward. What distinguishes a steward from a servant? Both a steward and a servant serve someone. Both have a responsibility and both work for a wage. The difference is that a steward has been charged with managing his master's assets. In Jesus' stories, we often see a pattern. The servant steward is charged with managing something important for his master while the master is away for an extended period. 
You can easily identify the one step where the steward has the chance to either fail or succeed at his mission and impact his future. It is in his opportunity. It has this little diagram here. I don't know how to turn that blur off. But there's five boxes from beginning to end. It says the commission of the steward, the master leaves, the opportunity of the steward, the master returns, and the reward of the steward. Jesus told parables about stewards for an important specific reason. He would soon be going away. During his absence, the business of his kingdom on earth would be delegated to his followers. They would be commissioned to spend their lives greatly increasing his kingdom. In the future, he would return, ask for an accounting, and reward his servants each according to his works. Matthew 16, 27. If you are a Christian, you are in the same circumstance as the early followers of Jesus. You have been commissioned to manage an asset for your master. Your asset is your life, the sum of your talents, strengths, personality, and interests. Your opportunity is to manage your life in such a way that you greatly increase your master's kingdom. Your master has not yet returned, and every day you should answer this question. How will I steward what my master has placed in my care? In fact, every day you are answering this question. In the parables we're about to look at, this truth is quietly but plainly evident. Whether you act intentionally on your commission or not, you are deciding by your actions and attitudes how you will steward your opportunity for God. Since our master is not physically present, good stewardship always requires faith. Faith that our master is who he said he is. Faith that what he asks us to do matters now and will matter when he returns. And faith that he will return. No wonder the Bible uses the word faithful more than any other to describe the conduct of a good steward. Paul said that in one nearly defined the other, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4.2 Jesus' two best known parables about stewardship, the parable of the minus or minus and the parable of the talents, both start with ordinary people in ordinary situations, but quickly enter into surprising territory. In the parable of the minus, found in Luke 19, a nobleman must leave town. He calls 10 servants and gives each one a mina or a mina, which is about three years' wages. The steward's assignment do business till I come. Verse 13. When the nobleman returns, he calls for an accounting. The first servant reports a tenfold increase on his investment of his master's mina. The master responds, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over 10 cities. The second servant reports a fivefold return, and the master gives him an exactly proportionate reward. You also be over five cities. Yet what is most notable is what the master doesn't say to him. He doesn't say, well done, or good servant, or even because you were faithful in very little. The lesser level of condemnation shows that the master knew the servant could have done more to multiply his mina. The third steward simply returns the mina he was given, explaining that he kept the money safely hidden at home. Imagine his shame when the master calls him a wicked servant, verse 22, then takes his one mina and gives it to the servant who already had 10. The nobleman explains that his actions with a startling statement, to everyone who has been given, no, to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Does this nobleman's response seem fair to you? When I teach on this parable, audiences often rush to defend the third servant. Wasn't he just being careful, they say? Besides, he didn't lose anything, Yet it doesn't take long as we talk about how we make decisions as parents, managers, or owners for us to agree. We in invariably give the greatest future opportunity to the person who has proven to be the most productive with the present opportunity. Fortunately for us, Jesus' parable shows the responses of all three stewards, and we can discover life-changing insights from each. Let's look at the three common misbeliefs about stewardship among Christians today and the corresponding truth Jesus wants us to see. We think that even though God gave us gifts and talents, he is not bothered if we don't make the most of every opportunity. But the truth of the first steward shows that God expects us to take the resources of our lives 
and greatly multiply them for his kingdom. We think that if God does reward us for serving him, his reward will be a general com commendation that will apply to everyone equally and won't change our future opportunities in his kingdom. But the truth of the second steward is that God will reward our work for him, but it will be direct proportion to how much we have multiplied our life for him. His response will have major and eternal impact on our future. We think that if we don't serve God with what he has given us, the worst that could happen would be no reward. But the truth of the third steward is that if we do not use what God has placed in our care for him, we will suffer loss of both the potential reward we could have earned and the opportunity to serve God more fully in eternity. I remember when the radical implications of these truths exploded in my mind and heart. Although I was very familiar with the parable, I never asked myself, am I a 10 mean a steward? The question launched a season of sober reevaluation and radical change in my life. Finally, a breakthrough came through. I chose to believe that since a 10 mina life was God's purpose for me, I would take it as the best measure of stewardship in my life. I committed to God that by his grace, I would become a 10 mina man for him. But maybe now by, by now you're thinking, I don't have many talents or opportunities, so how can I bring God much return for my life? And does that mean I won't have the chance to serve him much in eternity? An encouraging answer from Jesus is found in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. The story follows the same pattern as the parable of the minas, but this time three stewards are each given different amounts of money to each according to his own ability. In this case, two servants double what they have been given, yet when the master returns, he gives the same commendation and reward to both. Why? because the servant's reward is based on total results in light of potential. The master tells both servants the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. In the same way, Jesus will reward you and me on the basis of what each of us did with what we were given. Are you a seamstress or a leader of a nation, a factory worker or a young mother? a village pastor, or a builder. Every disciple has the same opportunity for productivity now and the same opportunity for great reward later. In fact, your future is as promising and important as the future of the most gifted person in history. For Sheila, a mother of toddlers, 10 mean a living has, been, has meant turning sincere intentions into a sensible plan, a weekly friendship group for struggling young moms in her neighborhood. For Mark, a developer in Arizona, 10 mean a living has meant redefining what do business implies. Increasingly, he is arranging his workload so he can spend the majority of his time providing building services at no cost to mission projects in Central America. For Jennifer, who went blind at the age of 15, 10 mean a living has meant that boundary lines have become starting lines. She now calls her blindness my difficult gift and is reaching thousands through music and speaking. I hope you never again think of faithfully serving God as merely not sinning a lot, doing business as usual, or just not quitting. True faithfulness as a steward is much closer to extra, no, extraordinary entrepreneurial excellence. Truth faithfulness as a steward is much closer to extraordinary entrepreneurial excellence. That's awesome. I open this chapter telling you why I believe we desperately want to serve God in heaven doing a servant's language of devotion. In heaven, more opportunity to do God's will through loving service will be our highest reward. Exactly how much opportunity will faithful stewards receive in heaven? So much that the upside down kingdom of heaven, the highest word for serving is ruling. We can trace this surprising reversal to the Garden of Eden. Remember that at creation, God made both woman and man for our particular task, to serve him on earth by stewarding his creation. Jesus confirmed this purpose when he told his disciples that the reward in heaven for serving him here would be to sit on the 12 thrones and judge the tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, 28. Ruling in heaven will have nothing in common with corruption and manipulation we're used to seeing in displays of power on earth. When the curse of sin is removed and you and I are restored to our creation purpose, we will be free to rule for God to our fullest powers while bringing only the highest good to ourselves and to others. Ruling is also the reward for serving we see in Jesus' parables of faithful stewards. Did you notice the 10 mina parable, the highest reward for service was to have authority over 10 cities? 
Luke 19, 17. And then the parable of the talents, the reward is similar. I will make you ruler over many things. Matthew 25, 21, 23. Serve faithfully here, rule perfectly there. My friend, I challenge you to see your true calling today and to seize the opportunity that is right in front of you. Don't waste another day living for less. Your commission for Jesus is as big as the world. Mark 16, 15. Your opportunity is now. Serve him faithfully on earth and you will be wonderfully, fully, perfectly prepared to do what you will desperately crave to do in heaven. And on that day, you will hear Jesus tell you from his heart, well done. Good and faithful, sir. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I hope you guys got a lot out of that. All right. Bye-bye.